Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I declare open the 19th session of the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you all to the 19th session of the Assembly, which we are holding in The Hague due to the difficulties of organizing the session in New York at this time. We are holding this session under the very unusual circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Forum Convention Center has implemented measures to diminish the risk to participants of, of exposure to the virus. I remind all participants of the need to respect the measures put in place, and I thank you all for your patience and understanding. As you know, our agenda for this session is ambitious, but I'm confident that the Assembly will carry out its duties responsibly and in a very timely manner. At this session, the Assembly will also take important decisions on the way forward for the review of the Court, which we embarked upon during 2019. Also, there must always be a common understanding that we, as state parties, stand by our commitment to international criminal justice. Before we proceed, let us rise and observe one minute of silence dedicated to prayer or meditation, in particular for victims. Thank you. As regards the seating arrangement, on the basis of a draw conducted at the Bureau, the delegation of Mauritius will sit at the first desk to the right of myself, the President. All other states follow in the English alphabetical order. For the observer states, as well as other observers, participants, and invitees, in accordance with Rules 92, 93, and 94 of the Rules of Procedure, seating has been reserved. I now invite our keynote speaker, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, His Excellency Mr. Stef Bloch, to address the Assembly. Minister Bloch will deliver his remarks via a pre-recorded video. Let us now listen to Minister Bloch's statement. Ladies and gentlemen, the Netherlands is proud to be the host state and a strong supporter of the International Criminal Court. Accountability and the fight against impunity are top priorities in Dutch foreign policy. The International Criminal Court is the embodiment of the idea that the most serious crimes are of concern to the international community as a whole. The English language has a wonderful concept that describes our sentiments with regard to the ICC. Tough love. 
you need to be firm with those you cherish in order to protect them and help them progress. Last year, firm words were spoken about the ICC and the state's parties. These firm words were necessary because we all strongly value the idea that serious crimes should not go unpunished and that victims deserve justice. And because we need the court to play its invaluable role in achieving this and as such to be beyond reproach in terms of conduct and performance. But even though international justice is under severe pressure, I am pleased that progress has been made over the past months. Progress concerning two suspects who have been arrested. The increasing readiness of Sudan to cooperate with the ICC. The steps the court has taken to improve its functioning. And the recent publication of the Independent Expert Reviews Report. Ladies and gentlemen, for the ICC to do its work, we need to be firm. We cannot allow non-state parties to obstruct the quest for accountability. The US sanctions are deeply disturbing, especially after we repeatedly urged the US not to impose them. As you may have read in Politico, my Benelux colleagues and I have called upon the incoming administration in the US to revoke the executive order against the ICC immediately. And I repeat that message here. We are not asking you to agree with everything the ICC does, but we are calling on you to revoke the sanctions against this independent international institution. Because you are attacking something that is valuable to us all. But being firm also requires critical self-reflection by member states, by the ICC. States parties need to support and facilitate the work of the court. For example, by promptly executing outstanding arrest warrants, but also by committing to witness relocation, the release of individuals, and the enforcement of sentences, by implementing amendments and reinforcing national capacities, by being firm with those countries that don't stick to the agreements we've made, and last but not least, by paying your contribution. Because the wheels of justice won't grind if there's nobody to turn them. The independent review provides clear guidance on how the ICC prosecutor and judges can work more effectively. But also on how the court can improve victim participation and reparations. And how the court's management can create a healthier working environment. I would like to stress in that context that there should be a zero-tolerance approach towards bullying and sexual harassment. And I call on the court to swiftly implement the recommendations in this regard. We also look forward to welcoming a new prosecutor and six new judges. And let me underline that candidates need to be elected on individual performance and merits. Madam Prosecutor, your successor will have big shoes to fill. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Fatou Ben Souda, and the outgoing judges, very much for your contribution to the fight against impunity. Ladies and gentlemen, to protect international justice and help it advance, more tough love is needed. We need to encourage states to join the Rome Statute system. We need to follow up on the Independent Expert Reviews report. And we need to be firm with each other and with ourselves. The review has provided clear guidance on the way forward. And now that way is clear, it's up to us to show that we have the will. The will to raise our game and fight impunity 
even better than before. I thank Mr. Block for his remarks this morning. I wish to note that I had invited the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, His Excellency Mr. Felix Chisekedi, to deliver keynote speeches as well. Regrettably, it would not be possible for President Chisekedi to address the assembly by a pre-recorded video. The statement of the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo will therefore be read in person at the general debate at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The provisional agenda for this ASP is contained in document ICC ASP-19-1 and Corrigendum 1, and an annotated agenda is contained in another document revision revised number 1. May I take it that it is the wish of the Assembly to adopt the agenda as contained in those documents? I see no objection. The agenda contained in those documents is adopted. So it's time to for me to make a report on the activities of the Bureau. For that purpose, I will move to the podium. As the President of the Assembly, I have the honor to report on the activities carried out by the Bureau of the Assembly of State Parties during intersessional period 2019 and 2020, and my term for the past three years. The full oral report of the Bureau will be included in the official records of this session. In the interest of time, I will not read it out in detail. However, I do wish to make a few remarks as I come to the end of my term. It has been an utmost privilege to have served in this prestigious position, which is the first diplomatic and political post that I have taken on in my career. I would like to express my sincere thanks to my colleagues, Ambassadors Horslund and Mulinar, without whose cooperation and advice I could not have managed my function. I'm truly grateful that we have been able to work so closely with each other, bringing together the two working groups of the Bureau. My thanks go also to the facilitators, focal points, bureau members, state parties, the principals of the court, the staff, and civil society. Thank you for your supporting me in this steep learning curve. I would also like to express my deepest thanks to the members of the Secretariat for their invaluable committed and self-sacrificing assistance. It was only thanks to them that I was able to perform my mandate so far. We have faced some challenges in my time in this position. These include a very heavy agenda of important matters for the future of the court and the assembly. And this year, the additional challenges of a global pandemic. However, there have been successes as well. In particular, I wish to highlight the independent expert re review of the court and the Rome Statute system, which provides excellent momentum for the strengthening of the ICC and the system as a whole. The experts have presented a report that is broad in scope 
and that contains an in-depth analysis of many areas that will require follow-up by state parties and the court. I have every confidence that moving forward, the work of the experts will be the tremendous benefit to the court and all stakeholders. When first elected as the president, I was ambitious with respect to the universality of the Rome Statute. I wanted to do my part to encourage growth in the number of state parties, in particular from my region, the Asia Pacific. In this regard, I was very pleased that we could welcome Kiribati as a state party in 2020, but still there's room for more progress on universality and I'm hopeful for the future. The ICC and the Rome Statute system is a unique creation of mankind in the fight against impunity. Now, more than 20 years after its establishment, it has formed a critical part of international rules-based order. However, however, as I emphasized on various occasions, the system of international criminal justice is still a growing organism. As such, we have a collective obligation to the future generation to care for its development. By enhancing the performance and the effectiveness of the court and the assembly through assessing and implementing the recommendation of the independent expert review, I hope that we can also take steps toward the universality of the Rome Statute. I wish to once again reiterate my sincere gratitude for all the support of all stakeholders in my time as president of the assembly. It has been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That said, may I take it that it is the wish of the assembly to take note of the oral report of the Bureau? I see no objection. It is so decided. The assembly has thus concluded this, uh, the consideration of this agenda, agenda item 10. Distinguished delegates, we turn to agenda item 11, report of the activities of the court. The report is contained in document ICC ASP slash 19 slash 9. We are honored to have the second vice president of the court, the prosecutor and the registrar present today. On behalf of the assembly, it gives me great pleasure to extend to them a warm welcome and to assure them of the continuing support of the assembly in the discharge of their respective responsibilities. The Assembly is aware of the enormous responsibilities inherent in their offices. The President of the Court, Judge Chile Ebue Osuji, has indicated that out of the abundance of caution in the present situation, he would not be physically present at the Convention Center, but will deliver a statement by, via pre-recorded video. I shall first give the floor to the President of the Court, Judge Chile Ebue Osuji. Let us listen to the statement of the President of the Court. Monsieur le Président et Monsieur le Vice-Président de l'Assemblée, Mesdames et Messieurs les Chefs des Délégations et les Délégués, Madame la Procureur, Monsieur le Gravier, Madame la Présidente du Conseil de direction de fonds affectation spéciale au profit des victimes, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est un honneur pour moi de prendre la parole devant la présente assemblée pour la troisième fois 
en tant que président de la Cour pénale internationale, c'est la dernière fois que j'aurai l'occasion de le faire. Mon mandat se terminera le 10 mai prochain. Je regrette qu'en raison du protocole lié à la COVID-19, qui est toujours en vigueur à la Cour, en ce qui concerne les rassemblements en présentiel, je dois prononcer cette allocution à distance et ne puisse le faire en personne. À la Cour, nous avons également dû organiser des audiences, des audiences à distance afin de limiter le nombre de personnes physiquement présentes dans le prétroit. Le nombre d'infections continue d'augmenter aux Pays-Bas comme ailleurs. Bien que les autorités néerlandaises dispensent les organisations internationales de la limitation du nombre de participants aux réunions à 30 personnes dans le même espace physique, il est toujours prudent d'interpréter cette exception à la lumière de la règle générale selon laquelle tout le monde est appelé à travailler à distance, sauf lorsque cela est matériellement impossible. Aussi, ce discours est-il prononcé à distance, tout comme celui de mon locution annuelle devant l'Assemblée générale des Nations Unies. As this is my valedictory speech, it would be ideal to use the opportunity to review some of the achievements of the past three years when I served as the President of the Court and reflect on some other areas where more work needs to continue. I cannot do justice to that discussion in the allotted time of just 10 minutes. I will therefore confine that fuller discussion to the written version of this speech, which will be posted on the website of both the Assembly and of the Court. Suffice it to say now that I leave the Court with a sense of immense gratitude to all of you who have uh, given me support and understood what drove me both at a personal level and in my efforts to serve the Court's mandate. I have received immense support and encouragement from the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and the various members of their senior management team, from heads of state and of governments of many states, from cabinet ministers of various states and their senior colleagues in governments, from ambassadors here in The Hague and in New York and their colleagues in the various missions, from the vice presidents of the court, my fellow judges, the prosecutor, the deputy prosecutor, the registrar, staff of the court, from counsel before the court, from members of civil society and from academics of various countries, not only in countries that are state parties to the Rome Statute, but also in countries that are not yet state parties. I am bound to note in this regard that some of the strongest support and encouragement that I have received have come from academics in the United States. For all this support and goodwill, I shall remain forever grateful. It is certainly true that the three years have been very exhausting at times and there have been episodes of bottomless frustration for which it is all too tempting to feel relief at the sight of light at the end of the tunnel. But all that pales in comparison to the immeasurable privilege of having served this court as its president for the past three years and as a judge for nine. 
the experience has been infinitely rewarding. And I feel truly blessed to have had the chance. A few of you may already know this story, but many of you do not. 53 years ago, a four-year-old boy was caught up in a brutal civil war in which many innocent human beings lost their lives. At the time of that war, that little boy had not yet started formal schooling, let alone have any dreams of his own to become a lawyer later in life. Today, that little four-year-old boy is a middle-aged man humbled by the privilege of saying to you, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to serve as a judge and as the president of this international court, a primary instrument of peace and human dignity in our world. As I take my bow, I will pledge to you my commitment to seize every opportunity available to me to continue to advocate for support and strengthening of this court in order that it can continue to strive to achieve its fullest remit as an instrument of peace and human dignity in every corner of our world. Comme je l'ai dit plus tôt, le reste de mon allocution sera présenté par écrit. Pour le moment, permettez-moi de vous dire très sincèrement merci. I thank President Ebue Osuji for his statement. His fuller written statement will be posted on the website of the Assembly. I now invite the Prosecutor of the Court, Ms. Fatu Bensuda, to address the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. President of the Assembly, Mr. Vice President of the International Criminal Court, Judge Perrin de Brichambeau, Mr. Registrar, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, and Representatives of Civil Society, dear friends from near and far, whether present here physically or participating virtually. It is an honor to address this assembly at the opening of this exceptional 19th session. We meet at the end of a particularly eventful and unprecedented year. If I were to describe the theme for the court in 2020, it is one of resilience and commitment in the face of great adversity. To begin with, the COVID-19 global health crisis that commenced early in the year has profoundly impacted the way we work and communicate. Across the court, we have had to quickly adapt to the new circumstances and adjust our work methods to secure business continuity while ensuring the safety and well-being of our staff and all others with whom we interact. The resilience the court has demonstrated in the face of this global pandemic alone is noteworthy. Hence, since 2020 also stands as a fundamentally important year in the historical record of this institution, when our shared values and commitments under the Rome Statute were tested by potent forces determined to undermine the court in order to shield themselves from legitimate legal scrutiny the statute demands. Here again, I believe the court and the Rome Statute system as a whole have demonstrated resilience in the face of such tactics. 
While grappling with these historical firsts and their multifaceted dimensions, the court has also seen an extremely active and busy year with efforts and activities related to the independent experts review and core mandate functions with seven cases in different stages of proceedings. This year alone, we saw the transfer to the court of Mr. Abdel Rahman, as well as Mr. Gicheru, with the ongoing preparations for trial in the Yakatom and Gaisona case, the start of trial in the Al-Hassan case, and the nearing conclusions of trial in the Ongwen case, with a verdict scheduled for February 2021. We hope that on the strength of our cases, we continue to build on the convictions we have secured in the Katanga, Ntaganda, and Al-Mahdi cases, all of which have followed the strategic course my office set at the beginning of my term, and the changes and improvements we have put in place since, with a focus on quality to secure successes in court. Additionally, the progress my office has made in situations under active investigations, including the cooperation prospects in Sudan following the prosecution's first visit to Khartoum since 2007, as well as the number of preliminary examinations recently concluded or nearing finalization, and the additional developments in the pipeline have demonstrated my office's tenacity and commitment to produce results. We are preparing the ground as best as possible for a smooth handover to my successor by mid-2021. Mr. President, this is my last opening address to the Assembly as ICC prosecutor. Since some nine years ago this month, when I was elected by consensus as ICC prosecutor, I had no illusions of the enormity of the task. The job of the prosecutor is an incredibly complex and demanding one. With this mandate comes great responsibility and fortitude. To my successor, to my successor whomever that may be, and those electing him or her, I would like to stress that assuming office as prosecutor means an unyielding devotion to the pursuit of international criminal justice without fear or favor even in the face of adversity, and a commitment to honorably and with integrity discharge a complex, multifaceted mandate, one that is largely without precedent with investigations and preliminary examinations covering situations spanning the globe. During my tenure, I have done my utmost to live by these convictions in the service of the Rome Statute. I am often asked, what has been the most significant challenge during my term. While one important challenge has been the political environment and other external conditions in which the office operates, another great challenge might well be the incompatibility of the mandate with the resources allocated to it. I say this with greatest of candor, and you have, you have me on record every year on this matter offering an honest reflection on the court's foundational goals, including expectations of states, civil society and victims, among other stakeholders, as well as my real concerns about managing a dilemma that will only intensify going forward unless it is properly addressed. This tension merits an urgent and strategic discussion, including with states' parties, that should go beyond notions of completion and prioritization, while recognizing that both are important concepts and also subject of my office's ongoing thinking. The predicament we are confronted with due to capacity constraints underscores the clear mismatch between the resources afforded to my office and the ever-growing demands placed upon it. We cannot wish away this tension or pretend that it does not exist. It is a situation that requires not only prioritization on behalf of the office, to which we remain fully committed, but as mentioned, open and frank discussions with the Assembly of States Parties and other stakeholders of the Rome Statute system on the real resource needs of my office 
in order to effectively execute its statutory mandate, the current trajectory is simply not sustainable. My office's forthcoming policy paper on completion will detail under what circumstances, in the context of my broad statutory discretion as prosecutor, the office will complete its work in situations where the court is exercising its jurisdiction. This may, in turn, contribute to enhancing the predictability of forecasting resources required in a situation and inform the transfer of resources to other situations to alleviate capacity concerns. But the policy is no panacea, and decisions on completion cannot be made on a whim, in particular in situations where proceedings remain ongoing or arrest warrants are pending, and indeed the prolonged nature of the residual activities associated with the various cases arising from a situation means that considerable time may pass before the situation can truly be regarded as complete. In this same vein, I wish to raise our preliminary examinations. Last year, before the assembly, I announced my intention to bring to a conclusion as many preliminary examinations as possible before the end of my term. As you would have noted with recent announcements I have made concerning the situations in Iraq, UK, Nigeria, and Ukraine, this resolve is very much on track. The Office's 2020 Preliminary Examinations Activities Report will also be issued very shortly, providing you with further details of the intense level of activity that has gone into this crucial aspect of our work. We have the opportunity to discuss the details during my Office's virtual site event scheduled for tomorrow. In relation to the recently completed preliminary examinations in Nigeria and Ukraine, we will need to take several strategic and operational decisions on the prioritization of the office's workload in light of the operational capacity of the office to roll out new investigations and the fact that several preliminary examinations have or are approaching the same stage. As mentioned, our resources situation is dire and needs to be rectified. I also intend to discuss these matters with the incoming prosecutor once elected as part of the transition discussions I intend to have. In the interim, the office will continue to take measures to ensure the integrity of any future investigations. My goal in this regard and others is to put my successor in the best possible position to carry forward the work and what we have in place. Mr. President, I consider it important, an important part of my legacy to hand over an office that is accountable at all levels, both in terms of performance and professional conduct. Such is achieved firstly through well thought through strategies and policies based on lessons learned and concrete experience that are being implemented and respected in practice. My office's consecutive strategic plans since 2012 are reflections of this goal and, as, and are the various policies promulgated by my office including on preliminary examinations, case selection and prioritization, sexual and gender-based crimes, crimes against or affecting children, in addition to forthcoming policies on completion of situations and the protection of cultural heritage within the Rome Statute framework. In addition, we have enhanced our quality control mechanisms, streamlined and strengthened our administrative procedures, improved transparency in how we conduct our work, and make significant efforts to build a positive office culture, including by adopting a code of conduct for the office with the mandatory trainings and instituting the core values of dedication, integrity, and respect. We have taken a systematic and committed approach to ensuring that the office uploads itself to the highest ethical standards and have taken concrete and consistent action to investigate and, where justified, hold those who breach those standards accountable in accordance with the court's legal framework governing staff conduct. I've always believed in the importance of ethics as the bedrock on which a prosecuting office 
not least one with such a crucially important mandate, must be built and carry out its work. We have put that belief into practice, and the record bears out the facts. Allow me now to turn to the independent expert review. From the outset, along with my office, I have viewed this process as a necessary initiative in the life of the ICC, and one that we considered to be very much in line with our own philosophy and commitment to take the office and the effective discharge of the mandate to the next level. We are looking to the report of the independent expert review, in, in, independent external experts for inspiration and fact-based actionable recommendations, which we can then carry forward with this overall objective in mind. The idea of a continuous improvement is deeply rooted in our thinking. My one regret with the expert report is that it has selected not to document and report upon all that is working and in place at the court, which could have provided greater context and been one of value to our stakeholders as areas in need of improvements are assessed and processed. Following internal review, my office is currently making an inventory of priority recommendations that can be implemented in the short and long term and identify those we objectively believe based on direct experience will not result in efficiency and effectiveness, but quite the opposite. Even where certain recommendations may not be adopted, we look to the underlying reasons why they are made to see if there is legitimate basis to process improvements. A full report will be shared in the first quarter of 2021. We are committed to dialogue with states' parties as well as civil society as key proponents of the review to take the process forward. If you will indulge me, I do hope that the next steps in the review process will also incite a productive discussions among states' parties on how they can, in their own right, more effectively and efficiently support the work of my office and the court more broadly such as through efforts to ensure more effective and tangible cooperation, including to the office's operations, in relation to a wide range of assistance types and sources of evidence. The work of the Office of the Prosecutor in, is indeed not only shaped by its own decisions. Throughout my term as prosecutor, I believe we have fostered and enjoyed a relationship of trust and mutual respect with the Assembly and its state's parties, as well as civil society representatives. We have benefited mutually from transparency and informed dialogue. We have spoken at various occasions this year about attacks and threats to the court. All here present have recognized the unacceptable nature of the measures taken by the U.S. administration. I am grateful to the ASP president and to all those who have spoken out in, on the matter through joint statements, individual expressions of support, or otherwise supported the court and me personally. The measures do not only constitute an attack on the court and the Rome Statute system, but a direct political affront to states parties and a dangerous precedent for a rule-based international system. It is my sincere hope that the U.S. reverses its aggressive policy of antagonism towards the court. No one wins from such attacks. Until such time, it is crucial that states' parties remain vigilant and keep close tabs on the matter, especially as further escalation remains on the table. Mr. President, as I conclude my last address as prosecutor to this August body, I recall the words of my election speech. I said that, Whilst I was presented as the consensus candidate of the African group, I would be the prosecutor of all states' parties, executing my mandate with dedication and resolve in an independent and impartial manner. During my term as prosecutor, I have done everything in my power to honor the trust and the responsibility bestowed upon me by implementing the crucial prosecutorial mandate to the best of my ability 
always in accordance with legal confines of the Rome Statute, with integrity, independence, and impartiality, and the plight of victims and affected communities in mind. We are not perfect. Show me a prosecuting office that is. But as an office, we have strived to learn and improve continuously to enhance the effectiveness of our working methods, operations, and efforts to fight against impunity. When objectively observed, the office today is a vastly improved iteration of what it was some nine years ago. And it has, to its credit, secured important achievements on the strength of the quality of its staff, the tenacity of our spirit, and clarity of purpose. I am proud of what we have built together as an office and the path to continuous improvement on which we have embarked upon. I'm also proud that we have demonstrated through deed and word that we, as an office, always pay homage to the Rome Statute and its laudable goals without fear or favor, and that we will not allow the cause of international criminal justice to be sacrificed at the altar of political expediency. Let us continue to benefit from the Assembly's honest commitment to the goals and values of the Rome Statute and through its decisions, drive the International Criminal Justice Project forward, fully equipped with your support for the years and decades to come. Thank you for the opportunity to serve as your prosecutor and for your continued support. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prosecutor, for your statement. I now invite the Registrar, Mr. Peter Lewis, to deliver his remarks to the Assembly. Your Excellency, President of the Assembly of States Parties, Your Excellencies, Vice Presidents of the Assembly, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Madam Prosecutor, Mr. Deputy Prosecutor. It's a great honor and privilege to be addressing the 19th session of the Assembly. When we met last year, we discussed the Independent Expert Review and how it could strengthen the court and prepare us for the future. Little did we know, before that review could report, we would face the most extraordinary set of challenges. In dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we needed to ensure the majority of our staff could work remotely. We could undertake a trial, hold appeal hearings, relocate witnesses, deliver reparations, conduct investigations, arrest suspects, and support the work of the assembly. In dealing with these challenges, we discovered we were more responsive more resilient, more flexible, and more innovative than we had imagined. We also discovered that the cooperation partnerships we'd established with states parties and the United Nations were robust and dependable, even in the most trying of circumstances. In any other year, our response to COVID would be the most significant experience to report to you. But in 2020, we faced a second and more profound challenge. As we came to understand the full impact of the US executive order, we realized that many fundamental issues we had taken for granted were no longer guaranteed. The ability, the ability of the court our members of staff and their families to bank, enjoy a pension, have medical insurance, be evacuated in the event of a medical emergency on mission, have a phone contract, access a computer, and many, many other things were suddenly at risk. 
we came to realize our vulnerability as an institution and as individuals. But we discovered we were not alone. We have a secure home and a safe haven in the Netherlands. We have enormous political support and practical support from you, the state's parties, both in your public sp statements and your quiet diplomacy. And we also discovered the support of civil society was as strong and vocal as ever. Your support sustained us politically and morally, and we found strength in your commitment and resolve. 2020 had, however, one more challenge for us. For many years, the Committee of Budget and Finance and our external auditors alerted us to our growing arrears and the liquidity problems this would bring. In 2020, we discovered this liquidity problem was not a technical accounting matter, as we faced an unprecedented level of arrears. Simply put, we faced the very real prospect in December of being unable to pay the staff salaries, the pension contributions, the medical insurance premiums, and meet our contractual obligations. The situation remains critical, and I urge all states parties to pay their outstanding contributions as soon as possible. Knowing our precarious position, a number of states have come to our rescue and made advance payments of their 2021 contributions. Similarly, other states have committed to making their 2021 payments as soon as they can after the program budget for 2021 has been approved by the Assembly. I am deeply grateful to these states for their support and generosity in these difficult times. Now, the Independent Expert Review has now reported. I want to thank again the experts for the very detailed and careful consideration they have given to the matter. And I look forward in the year ahead to considering the report's recommendations with you and hopefully agreeing on a change agenda in the years ahead to strengthen the court. There is one issue that the experts have raised which I wanted to focus upon today in view of its importance and the need for immediate action. As the report makes clear, the practices, policies, mechanisms and culture we now have in place are not producing a safe and secure workplace. This is an issue we must now address with the same focus, resolve and urgency we've applied to the other challenges we faced in 2020. We in the court have now taken an important first step in starting the recruitment of a focal point for gender. In the months ahead, we will also issue new, stronger policies on harassment and the disciplinary process. And I want to pledge my personal commitment to work with the leadership of the court during 2021 to develop a comprehensive initiative to address the issues. And in doing so, I look forward to receiving the help and support of those who have experience of successfully tackling these issues. In concluding my report for 2020, I would like to thank the President of the Court and the Vice Presidents for their leadership of, this, of the Court during this extraordinary year and for their guidance and direction. I would like to thank the Prosecutor and the Deputy Prosecutor as always, it has been a privilege to work with them. And in this year, Fatu's remarkable, remarkable courage and fortitude have been inspirational. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to the President of the Assembly and the Vice Presidents. We have been fortunate that in the time of our greatest challenges, we have had such skilled and exceptional champions of the Rome Statute. We all, we all owe you a great debt of gratitude. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Registrar, for your statement. I propose that the Assembly take note of the report of the International Criminal Court contained in document ICC ASP slash 19 slash 9. I see no objection. It is so decided. Distinguished colleagues, let us now turn our attention to agenda item 12, report of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. The report on the activities and projects of the Board for the period of 1st of July 2019 to 30th of June 2020 is contained in document ICC ASP slash 19 slash 14. I now have the honor to give the floor to Ms. Mama Koite Dumbia, Chair of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, Monsieur le Vice-président, Madame le Procureur, Monsieur le Régisseur, merci une fois de plus de nous retrouver dans cette auguste assemblée. C'est un honneur pour moi de m'adresser à vous pour la première fois devant cette assemblée en tant que président de direction pour vous présenter les activités du fond, les défis et aujourd'hui les perspectives. C'est tout à la fois un bonheur de retrouver tous en bonne santé avec cette COVID-19, mais aussi avec une note d'espoir. En effet, en avril de cette année, nous avons perdu notre président, le docteur Philippe Micheleni, à la suite d'un tragique accident à son domicile. Son décès survenu soudainement a été un choc cruel pour sa famille, ses amis et ses collègues, du fond au profit des victimes et la cour. Docteur Michelini a été un considérable défenseur des droits de l'homme, ce qui a fait de lui un ardent défenseur de la CPI depuis le débat, depuis le début, et le leader au sein du profit des victimes. Sa convivialité, sa solitude, sa solidarité et son leadership nous inspire aujourd'hui encore. Et la circonstance, j'exprime une fois plus ma reconnaissance à mes collègues, membres du Conseil, qui ont eu la confiance en moi, en me lisant à ce poste pour continuer les œuvres exaltantes entamées par notre chef Philippe. Lors de notre événement commémoratif de la semaine dernière, nous avons honoré l'héritage de Philippe en veillant à ce que les jeunes professionnels et chercheurs soient en mesure de soutenir la cause des victimes dans la justice internationale. Au nom du Conseil de direction au profit des victimes, je salue chaleureusement tous les délégués ici présents et ceux qui ne sont pas là malheureusement à cause de la COVID-19 pour cette session. En effet, la pandémie de la COVID-19 affecte le monde entier et personne n'est touché, plus que d'autres, sauf ceux qui sont déjà dans une position de vulnérabilité en raison des de préjudices qu'ils ont subis dus aux crimes les plus graves et atroces. De tels crimes ne se produisent pas fortuitement. Au moment où certains des autres sont poursuivis devant le CPI, à la Haye, nous devons plus que jamais oublier que ces crimes génèrent des dommages immenses et durables sur les populations civiles, innocentes, leurs familles et leurs communautés. L'importance, l'injustice subie à l'endroit de tant de victimes, en particulier avec, en ces temps de coronavirus, continue d'inspirer le conseil de direction au profit des victimes, à redoubler d'efforts pour donner espoir aux victimes et, à leur, et leur donner droit à un recours significatif et efficace 
de manière à ce qu'ils puissent retrouver leur dignité et espérer reconquérir leur avenir. Monsieur le Président, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, il nous appartient au fond de profit des victimes à la Cour ou aux États partis de poursuivre la bataille pour la justice réparatrice dans l'intérêt au profit des millions de victimes qui méritent reconnaissance et réparation. Le Fonds met en œuvre actuellement les réparations dans trois affaires ayant lieu dans les régions de l'Est de l'Outouri, en, euh, en RDC, et le Nord du Mali, qui continue malheureusement à être en proie à des conflits violents et confronté aussi à la pandémie de la, de la COVID-19. Ceci n'est pas une tâche facile, facile. Les victimes sont prisonnières et restent loin des procédures judiciaires, mais aussi du personnel et des partenaires d'exécution du fonds. Nonobstant cette situation, dans l'affaire Katanga, le fonds a directement mis en œuvre les indemnités individuelles et une grande partie des indemnités collectives de réparation, en particulier les activités génératrices de revenus et les frais de scolarité dans les princes de l'Utouri et de l'Est de RDC. L'octroi des indemnités et réparations par l'intermédiaire du personnel du fonds au profit des victimes a lieu en étroite collaboration avec les représentants légaux et avec le soutien important du greffe de la Cour sur le terrain ainsi qu'à la haie. Dans les, dans les affaires Lugamba et El Madi, le fonds à profit des victimes fait des progrès significatifs. Des partenaires de mise en œuvre allant des organisations de terrain aux organisations internationales telles que l'UNESCO ont été sélectionnés et engagés. À ce jour, plus d'un millier de décisions d'illégibilité positive et négative ont été prises par le Conseil de direction en 2020. En tant que membre du Conseil, de direction, directement impliquée dans les décisions d'éligibilité des victimes. Je peux personnellement témoigner ici de la rigueur et de la qualité des procédures administratives au secrétariat. Au fond, nous ressentons profondément notre responsabilité de collaborer avec la Cour et avec les États partis sur ces questions qui sont au cœur de la fonction réparatrice du statut de Rome. Monsieur le Président, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, je suis très heureuse de vous annoncer que l'année dernière, le Fonds a fait de grands progrès dans l'exécution de son mandat d'assistance. Le Conseil de direction a été très soucié de promouvoir et de guider le lancement de nouvelles activités d'assistance en 2020 en Ouganda, en RDC, en Côte d'Ivoire et en République centrafricaine. Le Conseil de direction a également décidé en novembre 2020 de démarrer le nouveau programme d'assistance au Mali, au Kenya et en Georgie. Monsieur le Président, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, le plan stratégique du Fonds au profit des victimes couvre la période 2020-2021, alignant sa date de fin sur le plan stratégique de la Cour. Sur cette base, le Fonds a établi deux objectifs stratégiques majeurs, l'impact et la performance. L'impact est lié à la valeur réparatrice concrète que le fonds apporte aux victimes, à leurs familles, à leur communauté. L'impact est rendu possible par les contributions volontaires des dons, des dons, des amendes et la confiscation des biens dans lesquels le fonds pour amener à bien ses activités de programme. La performance est liée quant à elle à l'efficience et à l'efficacité du fonds en tant qu'institution du statut de Rome, financée par les contributions mises en recouvrement des, des États partis. Il a également fait l'objet d'un examen externe approfondi par le mécanisme de contrôle interne en 2019 et par l'examen d'experts indépendants en 2020. En effet, au début du mandat actuel du Conseil, il, de, il y a deux ans, nous avons demandé une évaluation du secrétariat du Fonds par le mécanisme. En faisant cette demande, nous nous sommes joints aux États partis pour ce besoin. Nous avons entendu par l'adoption du nouveau plan stratégique de pouvoir consulter le rapport d'évaluation du mécanisme qui n'est arrivé qu'à la fin de 2019 et nous avons demandé au secrétariat exécutif d'élaborer rapidement un plan d'action et de mettre à disposition pour prendre en charge les recommandations. 
le conseil de direction a été plus actif et plus impliqué dans le travail du fond au profit des victimes que jamais auparavant. Cette année, nous, avons, nous sommes réunis plus de dix fois en session de distance au lieu de deux fois habituellement, au cours desquelles nous avons pris des décisions importantes pour placer le fonds sur la voie de la performance et l'exécution accrue des programmes. Nous avons donc finalisé le plan stratégique et approuvé l'adoption d'un outil de suivi des activités qui a intégré le plan d'action en réponse à l'évaluation du mécanisme. Nous avons engagé des discussions intensives avec le secrétariat sur les principaux défis sur les problèmes causés par la COVID-19 et les conflits en cours dans plusieurs de nos zones d'intervention et le développement des ressources avec les donateurs actuels et potentiels. Le Conseil a approuvé avec satisfaction le lancement d'activités d'assistance et de réparation planifiées de longue date à sept pays de situation. En dehors des sessions de Conseil, nous nous sommes engagés avec les parties prenantes locales et avons autant que possible suscité les encouragements aux victimes. J'ai été directement impliqué dans les réunions avec les victimes dans l'affaire Al-Madi. Ma compréhension de la situation au Mali a contribué à l'élaboration d'un nouveau programme d'assistance a, a permis d'obtenir un financement important avec certains partenaires techniques et financiers qui sont au Mali. Nous avons réussi à entretenir d'excellentes relations avec les autorités. Monsieur le Président, Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, au secrétariat du Fonds, il y a un nouveau paradigme avec l'aboutissement des idées, des initiatives antérieures, même avant l'évaluation de l'OIM. À 2020, les performances budgétaires du secrétariat du Fonds dépassent en fait les attentes. La résolution de ces problèmes exige la, la persévérance du temps ainsi que la coopération accrue avec le greffe pour alléger les contraintes administratives. Je suis extrêmement reconnaissante à M. le greffier Peter Lewis pour ses précieux conseils, son soutien sans faille au conseil et au secrétariat, offrant un soutien organisationnel crucial, par exemple, pour résoudre les problèmes liés au recours au service des partenaires d'exécution. Outre la mise en œuvre et le développement des ressources que j'ai mentionnées ci-dessus comme étant des défis importants, il y a un autre grand défi pour le fonds au profit des victimes, la communication, que nous cherchons à résoudre avec beaucoup d'initiatives en cours. En concentrant la majorité des ressources budgétaires limitées sur les activités liées à la mise en œuvre de réparation et de l'assistance, la capacité de communication du secrétaire est restée sous-développée. Cela a eu un impact négatif sur la visibilité des réalisations du fonds et dans certaines mesures a également influencé la qualité et la profondeur de l'examen interne, comme par les experts indépendants. Sur l'avis du directeur exécutif, le Conseil a accepté de publier ses principaux rapports internes, tels que la note de gestion trimestrielle au Conseil, le suivi des activités du plan stratégique. Avec ces initiatives, le Fonds rend compte de manière plus transparente de ses résultats et activités dans la mesure du possible, compte tenu de la confidentialité requise pour la mise en œuvre des indemnités de réparation. En prenant note du rapport de l'examen pour un expert indépendant, nous avons grandement apprécié, nous, au Conseil, notre appréciation importante du travail pour l'amélioration des performances et des, instituts, et des institutions de, de statut de Rome, que sont la Cour, le Fonds et l'Assemblée des États partis. Le Conseil et le secrétaire du Fonds sont fermement résolus à engager un dialogue ouvert et franc pour atteindre cet objectif pour une justice réparatrice, efficace, significative pour les victimes. Le Fonds au profit des victimes appelle à une responsabilité partagée à une action conjointe entre le Fonds, l'Assemblée des États partis, la Cour et la société civile, en particulier en cette période difficile de la pandémie de la COVID-19, afin de garantir que les victimes des crimes les plus graves puissent véritablement jouir de leurs droits aux réparations et à l'assistance dont elles ont besoin pour surmonter leurs préjudices. Plus que jamais, nous avons besoin de solidarité. 
d'espoir et de volonté politique, de ressources financières et d'une action commune pour faire de la justice réparatrice une réalité pour les victimes. Je ne veux pas terminer ce discours avant pour exprimer toute notre gratitude et notre fierté au président partant, euh, M. Ongong, à Mme Fatou Ben Souda et pour euh, avoir annoncé son départ et au président de la Cour pénale internationale pour tout l'appui que nous avons eu auprès d'eux afin que le fonds au profit des victimes soit capable de répondre de façon efficace et efficiente à ces deux mandats. Merci beaucoup pour tout le soutien. Merci pour cette vision que vous avez de la justice réparatrice qui va faire le succès du statut de Rome. Je vous remercie. I thank Ms. Koite Dumbia for her statement and on behalf of the Assembly ask that she convey to the distinguished members of the Board the appreciation of the Assembly for the significant work in which they are engaged and for their commitment to the Court, especially to victims. The Assembly and indeed the victims are very appreciative of their tireless efforts. I propose that the Assembly take note of the report of the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims contained in document ASP-19-14. I see no objection. It is so decided. The Assembly will now begin its consideration of Agenda Item 7. In accordance with Rule 25 of Rules of Procedure, a Credentials Committee consisting of representatives of nine state parties shall be appointed at the beginning of each session on the proposal of the President. After broad consultation with state parties, it would seem that, uh, that there is an agreement as to the composition of the Credentials Committee. Consequently, on the recommendation of the Bureau, I propose that the Credentials Committee consist of uh, the following states. Argentina, Belgium, Finland, Hungary, Mexico, and Romania. May I take it the Assembly agrees to proceed accordingly? I see no objection. It is so decided. The Assembly will appoint the remaining three members of the Credential Committee at a later meeting. I wish to remind representatives that pursuant to Rule 25, credentials shall be submitted to the Secretariat, if possible, not later than 24 hours after the opening of the session. Credentials shall be issued by the head of state or government or by the Minister of Foreign Affairs or by a person authorized by either of them. I now suspend cons consideration of agenda item seven. The assembly will resume its consideration of this agenda item at a late, later stage. Now I turn to observer state and non-state parties. Distinguished delegates, in accordance with paragraph 1 of Article 112, I'm sorry, 112 of the Rome Statute, states, states that are not parties to the statute but have signed either the statute or the final act of the Rome Conference may participate as observers in the Assembly. Observer states are allowed to participate in the deliberations of the assembly, but may not participate in the taking of decisions. States, uh, those states that are not parties to the Rome Statute 
and that have not signed the final act or the statute do not have observer status. Rule 94 of the Rules of Procedure provides that at the beginning of each session of the Assembly, the President may invite those states to be present during the work of the Assembly, subject to approval from the Assembly. I propose that the Assembly invites the following states, which do not have observer status, to be present during the Assembly's work. Bhutan, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Equatorial Guinea, Kingdom of Eswatini, Laos People's Democratic Republic, Lebanon, Mauritania, Federated State of Micronesia, Myanmar, Niue, Palau, Papua New Guinea, Rwanda, Somalia, South Sudan, Tonga, Turkmenistan, and Tuvalu. May I take it that the Assembly wishes to invite these states to be present during its work? I see no objection. It is so decided. <coughs> Distinguished delegates, we shall now turn to agenda item eight, organization of work. The Bureau has considered the program of work which is reflected in the ASP journal. The journal has been disseminated this morning. The Bureau proposes that this program form the basis of our work for this session. I trust that you will all understand that the program of work may be subject to modification depending on the progress attained on the different items. In view of the number of items to be considered at this session, and the limited duration of the session, I would ask each representative to ensure that he or she arrives on time to the meeting and that the assembly completes its consideration of all the items on its agenda for the 19th session. That said, may I take it that the assembly decides to adopt the program work contained in, a in the ASP journal dated 14th of December 2020. I see no objection. It is so decided. As proposed by the Bureau, the Assembly will meet in plenary session and may hold informal consultation on the key issues on which decisions must be taken. On a separate note, at its 11th of December 2020 meeting, the Bureau recommended that the following representatives serve as coordinators for the 19th session. For the working group on the program budget for 2021, Ambassador Andres Terran Paral of Ecuador, and for the informal consultation on the omnibus resolution, Mr. Vincent Rittner of Switzerland. May I take it that, that the Assembly wishes to proceed on this basis? I see no objection. It is so decided. I congratulate Ambassador Terran of Ecuador and Mr. Vincent Rittner of Switzerland, and I wish them every success as they carry out their responsibilities. I wish to assure them that they can rely on the Bureau to provide any guidance that may be necessary. The Assembly now turns to, turns to the agenda item six, states in arrears. According to article 112, paragraph eight of the Rome Statute, I quote, a state party which is in which is in arrears in the payment of its financial contributions towards the cost of the court shall have no vote in the assembly 
and in the bureau if the amount of its arrears equals or exceeds the amount of the contributions due from it for the preceding two full years. The Assembly may, nevertheless, permit such a state party to vote in the Assembly and in the Bureau if it is satisfied that the failure to pay is due to conditions beyond the control of the state party." End of quote. The Secretariat sent a note verbal dated 3rd of November to all concerned states via their United Nations missions as well as their embassies in The Hague and Brussels, informing them, informing them that they were in arrears, recalling the provisions of resolutions ICCASP slash 4 resolution 4 on the request for exemptions as well as stating the minimum payment required to avoid the application of Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute. In accordance with the information provided by the court, it would appear that Article 112, Paragraph 8 of the Rome Statute is currently applicable to nine nine state parties. The number of state parties to which this provision is applicable may rise as of 1st of January 2021, once the contributions due for 2020 become arrears. The Bureau of the Assembly has received requests for an exemption from the loss of voting right from two state parties. The Bureau began its consideration of this matter at its meeting on the 11th of December and will make a recommendation to the Assembly in due course. I would also like to invite state parties that are subject to Article 112, Para 8 of the Rome Statute that wish to request an exemption from the loss of voting rights to submit a formal request via the Secretariat of the Assembly of the State Parties. I wish to once again stress the importance of ensuring that the court is provided with the necessary financial resources. I encourage all state parties to transfer their assessed contributions in full and on time, or in the event of pre-existing arrears, immediately in, in accordance with Article 115 of the Statute and Rules 101.1 .1 of the Financial Regulations and Rules. The Assembly will return to this agenda item at a later time. Distinguished delegates, we have concluded our business for the first plenary meeting. We will meet here at 1500 hours sharp to begin the general debate. I wish to announce that the Credentials Committee will meet immediately following the adjournment of this meeting in Europe 1 and 2. The Credentials Committee will consider the credentials for both the Hague and the resumed session in New York so as to expedite the work for the resumed session which will start on the 17th of December. In addition, the Bureau will hold its 15th uh, meeting virtually at 12 o'clock very soon. I wish you all a pleasant lunch break and see you back here at 1500 hours. The meeting is adjourned.